All right, everybody, welcome back to the Move Podcast brought to you by Patron Tequila. We're going to name a couple of Patrons today, uh, a couple of epic vintages of the great Perry Rebay. Full disclosure, I do not know shit about this bike race, but fortunately, um, I have people that do. Uh, uh, we're going to cover 1994, one of the coolest ones to watch ever, and then 2005, which my co-host, George Hincapie, features prominently in his best result ever. Uh, also, uh, somewhere else here in Austin, Texas, JBH, a.k.a. JB Hager. And then somewhere over across the Atlantic, Mr. Johan Bernil, who also has a special guest queued up to come talk to us here in about 20 or 30 minutes. Before we get to it, um, I just want to give a personal shout out. I, let me just speak on behalf of this whole team here. You know, the job uh, that, um, that, that the front lines are doing on coronavirus, the doctors, nurses, researchers, technicians, um, just amazing work. Um, and, and don't think for a second that we, we, we don't appreciate it. I tell you, watching, I don't know if you guys have seen the stuff on TV or on social media, the, the, the uh, shift changes in New York City. Um, if you haven't, just kind of, I guess you would Google shift changes, but to see uh, the people who are, uh, who are quarantined uh, which is everybody coming out and, and cheering on doctors and nurses as they make the shift change. I tell you what, if you don't get chills from that, then you don't have a heartbeat. So um, thanks for everything. Uh, we, we, we really appreciate it. As I said last week, uh, this show um, can be enjoyed audio only, but I think it's probably better since we're watching the bike race. And, 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 uh, and I know all you girls out there like to watch George too. The only way you're going to get to see that is either on YouTube or Facebook. This is better on video. Um, and you'll just have to forgive the other three of us or just cover up your screen. But, um, although someone's looking pretty lean over there, I'm telling man, you, man, I'm, I'm telling you what I that, that this, I am less and less prosperous. <laughs> I'm coming. I told y'all, I said, I, this is, this is bullshit. These George fans, I've had enough. I've had enough I'm down like 12 pounds training with college. Wow. You know, he's, he's out doing intervals. He says, I don't know if you can go with me today. I said, Ed College, did you win eight tours? Did I forget to read? Did I not? Did I miss that? This guy walks around like he won eight tours in four Roubaix, six Flanders, you know, three Giros. <laughs> Fucking guy. Uh, before we get to the action, a little bit of business. Today's show is brought to you by PowerDot, as I say all the time, and, and it's, it's, I'm proud to say it. Uh, full disclosure, us at Next Ventures are, are investors here in PowerDot. It's, I don't know if that's an endorsement or a disclaimer. Uh, this is a product and a brand that I absolutely love. Look how small this is. By the way, I got a big old head. I mean, this is like, it's pretty dang small. Um, I carry it everywhere I go. I got my, look, my backpack here. This thing sits in here. I literally, every, whether it's at home, in the car, on the road, in planes, uh, planes, trains, automobiles, it's with me. Mobile e-stem, you know, as, as, I, as George's fans start heckling me on Instagram, calling me fat and prosperous, sitting on the wheel, all these things. I was like, that's enough. I started training. I started training my ass off, literally. And uh, I started having, just, you know, I've made some equipment changes, had some little, you know, I'm getting, pushing 50. And the body was just aching. I, I have been, I'm literally addicted to my power dot, um, primarily in the low back area, but all the things, you know, it's at home muscle recovery. It's all in one muscle simulator. It's controlled by the app. Obviously download the app, sync it up to your Bluetooth, uh, TSA approved, uh, for our listeners, 20% off, go to powerdot.com. The buy code is the move powerdot.com and the buy code. Don't go to powerdot.com slash the move. That's during the tour, which I guess we can talk about in a second. Uh, the buy code is the move. Today's show is also brought to you by The Feed. Great folks out of Boulder. 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 Dude, there's so many cool things in Boulder, dude. Dude, I got the flat irons. You got C. You got boss, dude. But I'll tell you what's really cool. What is seriously cool is The Feed. Like when we race, and you'll see this in some of the footage that we watch today when guys go through the feed zones, you know, they're just grabbing bags. And like I said last week, you could be going five miles an hour. You could go, be going... 35 miles an hour and they're grabbing these bags that are that are that's essentially their lunch that's what they've curated for their lunch that's their feed bag well these guys uh and the team over at the feed they've they've made it a business so you can go in and essentially curate your own feed bag and 
and, and, and pick your favorite drink, pick your favorite bar, your favorite gels, your favorite shoes, favorite whatever. They also sell a bunch of other stuff. They sell Power Dots, they sell Ampium, and they sell a bunch of other great brands. Um, it, but the cool one right now that they're doing, so for now, in the, in the middle of the whole corona frenzy, uh, rightfully so, free shipping. Um, they've also got the, the back in, in stock. I understood um, it sold out. The immunity pack sold out. The immunity pack is back in stock. Um, and so for our, our buy code, um, it is the feed.com slash the move. Not, that's not a buy code. That is a URL, the feed.com slash the move. Well, hope everybody's staying safe and healthy. Thanks to everybody at the feed. So, so guys, we're going to cover, uh, 1994 and 2005. George, I just want to first go to you. Cause I don't, as I, as I admitted a second ago, I don't know anything about this race. I, the, my extent of knowledge, you know, my knowledge here is, is, is the few stages that we've done at the tour that have cobblestones, which of course is like, you know, uh, well, I could compare it to a lot of things, but I won't, but it's, it's not much. Um, so just give us, and, and again, when we start with 94, we're going to start, we're just going to jump straight into the fire, 1994, um, forgive us of the, the coverage back in the mid nineties, but we're going to start right in the Arenberg forest. How nasty, start with talking about Arenberg, but just, you know, it's how bad, how rough are these cobbles? <laughs> well, much like Tour of Flanders, which we discussed last weekend, it's, it's right up there in terms of how hard of a race it is. Tour of Flanders and Roubaix are definitely the hardest races on the calendar. The difference between Flanders, obviously, the obvious differences are Flanders has got a ton of climbing. Roubaix is dead flat, which, which might indicate it's a bit easier, but it's not because the cobbles are much rougher. The cobblestones in Flanders are very uniform, although difficult, but you kind of know what you're going to get. The cobblestones in Roubaix are very jagged all over the place. There's a big crown in the middle of the cobbles, whereas if it's wet, if you get off of that crown, it's very easy to slide right off of that and crash. Um, and it's just very, very damaging to the body. Your body gets more damage in that race than really any, definitely any race in the calendar. How about the taint? What happens to the, the, the taint must just get rocked. <laughs> I, I kind of describe it as like, if there's anything in cycling that you can describe as torture, Torture is Roubaix on the taint on the you get between on the tween you get blisters on the hands. Mm. Uh, it's like it's unlike any other race on the calendar where those last couple sections you are not only are your legs on fire but all the little things that you don't really feel on at other races are also on fire. So it's just the amount of pain your body goes through in that race is is quite impressive. And so just, and I want to ask you a question about this in a sec, Johan, but so, and we're going to see one vintage in 1994 where this has terrible weather, and then we're going to see 2005, which has good weather. It, it, as somebody who's done it a lot, how big is the difference between those two? Well, when it's, when it's raining, um, which we'll see in a bit, and 94 was a bit of a sketchy, definitely a very sketchy uh, addition of Perry Bay, you're almost, you're almost guaranteed to crash. And you just hope it's not going to be a bad one. Uh, you hope that you can just kind of slip and slide and get back up and get going again. Uh, I'll never forget looking out the window in 94 Roubaix. It was snowing. And here I was my first year at Roubaix. And I was just over, over the moon and, and excited and happy and felt privileged to be there, which I think most people thought that that was kind of weird. Um, but it was a race that I had dreamed of doing my whole life. And it was awful conditions. But I was very excited. Perhaps the way I grew up racing in New York and the bad weather and I just felt really at home and it was uh, looking forward to the chaos that, that race was going to bring. Um, but like I said, when it's raining, it's definitely more nerve wracking um, and very stressful. I also think it'd be great to get George's uh, thoughts and comments on, and which we'll see when we, we look at 2005, that the track finish coming into play. Oh, which yeah. you, you hope to not have a track finish, but I know you can speak uh, firsthand on that. Oh yeah. No, that's, that, that adds a whole new, a whole new dimension to the to the finish of that race, which a lot of teams in the meetings, I just kind of miss that that particular part of the race. You know, it's the most important part of the race, well, one of the most important, but shit, you get to the track, you're on a velodrome. Most of these guys have never ridden the velodrome. It's like, what the hell do you do now? So a lot of the, it's funny how a lot of, I've done 17 editions and a lot of the meetings, like nobody ever really talks about, hey, when you get onto that track and you're with the, the first group, what do you do? So there's a lot of different uh, tactical plays that can come into uh, to play there. By the way, as the lore has it, the race was started 
in order to promote the velodrome. I think I read that right. You know, you had, they were like, well, how the hell do we get people to come to this venue? And so they dreamed up this race. I think I, again, I think, I, Johan, you might know better than me. You're, you're, well, you're good. It's, it's uh, a long time ago, there was a lot, a lot of races that finished on a velodrome. Just to give you an example, Eddie Merckx, who won the Tour de France, I don't, I don't know the years, but, but started in the late 60s until mid-70s. All of his five victories finished on a velodrome in Paris. So there was a lot, a lot of bike races who finished on a, on a velodrome, which you know, makes it interesting, of course, for the, for the spectators. So I, I, my guess would be that Paris-Roubaix was one of those, one of those races that uh, finished for that reason on a, on a velodrome. And Johan, you ne- did you ever do Roubaix? I never did Roubaix as a, as a cyclist. I just, as you, I only well, how, did. Uh, well, hang on. How else would you do it? <laughs> no, as, no. I mean, I've done it many times as a sport director. Oh, but yeah, no, but that, we know that. But as, as a cyclist, as a cyclist, the same as you, I've done it. Uh, I've done like the last uh, seven or eight sections in, uh, in one edition of Tour de l'Avenir. So same uh, thing. Yeah. yeah. I tell you, the times I've done it, 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 it is, it, it is. Cyclists, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, we, no, no, there's no doubt. We are white. We are straight up white collar. Yeah. <laughs> I was listening to this country and Western song the other day, and it was the, the chorus was some like, you know, uh, 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 red neck, blue collar, white. The, the white, what was the white? Anyways, that has nothing to do with Paris Roubaix. <laughs> but, but anyways, let's jump right into 1994. This was I remember watching this one, and just you'll see again as we touched on last week, the sport completely different. As George said, you know, races like this, you just know you're going to crash at some point. You, you'll see this is again pre helmets or pre uh, helmets being required. These guys just racing with no helmets. Like to me, it's just. In a race that's that dangerous where you know you're going to crash and you just wake up and you're like, you know, fuck it. I'm going to go helmetless today. But you'll see it. I mean, this is, this is and, and you know, w- w- whether it's Andre Schmiel who wins this edition or even back, you know, uh, Gilbert Duclos LaSalle who always raced uh, without helmets. This is also right around the time that teams and, and, and bike companies started playing around with suspension, which, um, which was an interesting experiment and one that didn't last. I mean, it's a great idea for for bikes and for mountain bikes, but never made it. It never crossed over here. Something that makes so much sense. Um, it, it never came to be. We'll jump right in. All right, here, we're just going to jump straight into the hell right here, right into the force of Ehrenberg. Look at this. I mean, this is, again, uh, n- not anything that I know about. Uh, George, I might just throw to you. By the way, I mean, these guys aren't going slow. Even this image, to me, as I watched it last night briefly, George, is this downhill? I mean, if I had to swear, I would say that looks either really downhill or at least slightly downhill. So you come, you have a really straight... Oh, wait, hang on. Look at this. Just yard sale. People everywhere. Holy shit. I think I was in that crash. No, no, that's later, George. This is, this, so this is uh, Duclos Lazal, uh, one of the big favorites, the winner of the year before, actually, who has a crash, who, uh, you know, meets another wheel will be incredibly far behind. And here we have Chmil leading it uh, with Van der Poel, I think, and Museo. Yeah, so Lance, to go back to your question, as you, that's one of the few sections where we actually have a dead straight flat run into it. So you could see it coming for like two or three kilometers, and it's basically a full gas fuel sprint into it. And then the first half of it is about one, two percent slightly downhill. So you come into it about 30 miles an hour and uh, you don't slow down until about halfway through it. And if it's slick, if it's slick, there's a, you know, it's a very, very dangerous section. So look here, this, these are the first guys. I don't know who this telecom guy is. The That's telecom. Schmiel. It, it, yeah. Schmiel in second. And then here we have uh, Van der Poel and Verhoeven. This is uh, 100 Mark, I think. Yeah, here comes 100 Mark from Motorola. Kai 100 Mark was in the front? Yes. Yep. Wow. Yes, Look at the crowds. I mean, again, just this is this is old school. I mean, I don't know. I I think now, George, again, that the, the, these are all barricaded and the fans are kept back. That this is all just. I mean, this you can't even tell where the people end and the bike race begins. <laughs> yeah, look at the riders going on the side. That's that's great. Look at this. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't believe how far they went into the crowd back then. 
Well, again, if, if JB, if they've got these sections on the side that are smooth and it's not barriered off or barricaded off, then they're going to go, they're going to jump over there. Look in the back. There's Kai Huntermark jumping over there. I mean, why wouldn't you? Hell, we all would. Well, you, gotta, you gotta save the taint somehow. It's not that smooth, but it's not as bad as the uh, college. Where you can get stuck in that mud as well. Um, but like you said, now it's all barricaded. You can't. You don't have the option to go into the mud. You know, I just think I just thought of something. Um, you know, every week we 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 say things, and we, and it feels like we just came up with a new T-shirt. You know, uh, seeing the douches, uh, panakukin. We just came up with one. Save the taint. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's. I feel like that'd be a big seller. I like it, especially right now. I mean, with everybody thinking about these serious things, we gotta save the tank too. Yeah, I like that. I, I got a lot of requests actually for the "Don't be a panic cooking" T-shirt too. So. Yeah, you're. Yeah, don't be a panic cooking. No, we're not gonna say panic cooking, guys. We have to. It's panic cook singular. Oh, okay, whatever. We can't Americanize it. <laughs> But again, this is just to me. This is it, it, it's it's hard to even as a, as a if you were a lay person watching this, this doesn't even look like a sport. It is that. So here, look at the front suspension, and as I alluded to earlier. So there, you know, you're starting to see Guido Bontempi passes yeah. Olaf Ludwig. O- Olaf Ludwig. Um, I mean, this these doesn't already, even. These guys are already quite quite far behind. Here comes Duclos. Here, here Lasalle. comes Duclos Lasalle, two-time winner. Yeah. By the way, can we talk about Duclos Lasalle's preparation for this because? Back in the day, they used to say, like, he would do Tour of Flanders. That night, fly to Pay Basque in Spain and do a five-day, one of the hardest stage races in the world, five-day stage yeah. race, come back on, like, look at, Thursday look or Friday, at, then race for day on Sunday. Let's talk about that because here, I think we're going to see, that, so these are the first guys. In a little bit, we're going to see a little group. Uh, I mean, we'll try to distinguish it in between, in between all the people. And, and I guess, you know, you doing your first uh, Paris-Roubaix, you're gonna meet, but but uh, but, but George, I mean, the, but guys, there are barriers now. This I don't. This looks. Yes. No, there are barriers now. This yes. okay. Well, I'm I'm just gonna say, take away the barrier. This is way cooler than having the <laughs> fucking barrier. This is way cooler. Look at this is like going up Alpe d'Huez. Like let oh, yeah. these. This is amazing. Yeah, I mean it's it's definitely cool visually, but not that safe. <laughs> <laughs> so look here, you have the five the five first guys. So that's Schmil, Museu, Ballerini. Uh, Hundert Mark and the, t- the T-Mobile guy, but you'll see. I mean, these guys are already on the on the on the normal road, and they ke- they still keep coming. This is Olaf Ludwig coming. And just to put it in perspective, obviously, and I, we touched on this last week. There's the way that, and we'll see this as the coverage goes on. These sections are categorized. So just like in the tour, you would have, you know, a Cat Four, Cat Three, Cat Two, Cat One, and a horse category. Um, same with the cobbles. They're one stars all the way up to five stars. This is clearly a five star section, meaning it's the roughest. Uh, we'll get to some other. Jean Marie LeBlanc hanging Jean-Marie out of the top LeBlanc. of the. Jean Marie yeah. LeBlanc, the great uh, race director uh, for ASO. Uh, a, believe it or not, a Bonesto rider. I mean, this is in the era of peak Miguel Indurain uh, uh, dominance. Uh, so, George, George, George just went down. Did you see that, George? Oh, yeah, I saw it. Yeah, and like, like five people were picking you up. You didn't even have a chance to <laughs> figure out what happened. No see? helmet on, by the way. No helmet on. I did probably eight Roubaix without a helmet, which is wow. one of the more stupidest things I've done in my, in my life. <laughs> Dmitry Konashev. Here comes Konashev in the yeah. Jolly jersey, the Sean neon Yates. yellow. Sean Yates here in, behind. So this is why there this is why there shouldn't be barriers because if you fall down people will actually help you up. That's that is such a great thing. So now we got we got uh, some uh, some regroupment. Uh, we have uh, Eric van der Waarden here, who's uh, I think he was riding for an Italian team back then. Uh, so all the favorites basically are back together now uh, in one of the next sections after the Arenberg. Here goes Duclo Lazal. And that's Museo in his wheel, I guess. Yes. So Zucro Lazal is with the Rock Shocks uh, suspension fork. And yep. Museo, very, very important, uh, is riding a prototype, big crash here, uh, <laughs> prototype, prototype uh, bike with rear suspension, which is going to be interesting uh, later, in the, later in, the, in the race. I mean, this, is, this just doesn't, to me, 
and I think to most people watching that that previous shot this doesn't even look like a bike race. Nor, actually, nor does this either. All you gravel fans out there, eat your heart out. This is this, and look at Schmiel just on the pedals, high cadence, just looking smooth. Is that uh, that's Verhoeven? That's Nico Verhoeven at the back of that group. Wow, we 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 touched on him last week covering. Uh, Aldato is there. The 95 Tour of Flanders. Papio is there. Olaf Ludwig. And at this point, the, the great, you know, Duclos LaSalle was, was, was uh, Johan, correct me, uh, or, or refresh my memory. He's 40-ish. I mean, this, is, this guy 40 was... 40 years old. In, the, in, in this race, he's 40 years old. And he and won I, it the year before. And I want to... Did he not win one year a, a, as a grandfather? <laughs> no, I, I swear know. to God. No, I swear I to God. He had, he, was, he had a grandkid and he won the fucking bike race. I don't know. I mean, the year before, this is 75 kilometers to go, but he, the year before he won against uh, Franco Ballerini. Now here, this right, is... Here, here, comes our, here comes our man's move. Look at this. Boom. And... Bruno Bolskardin. There's a name. Yeah, he's in the front. Wow. wow. It's the one, one leader in the front. We haven't seen that, but... Yeah. This is Nico Verhoeven so trying, Verhoeven to, trying to, get, to... trying to catch the wheel. Unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, this and again, guys, these guys and gals, this, are, this is flat. These roads are flat. So the only thing separating these guys um, is really just the pave and, and just the ability to, to pedal over them. I mean, there's not, I guess at some point there, there, could right. be, there would be it'll some be, wind. It would be interesting to, uh, once uh, Johan translates Andre's uh, answers to his questions, what was he thinking when he attacked here? But my guess is he's thinking there's no real – strength and team numbers there so everybody's basically mano a mano so if he's yeah. going to attack people are going to have to try to work together to catch him it's so a bit it's different it's a bit different his explanation is a bit diff different and very unique actually um he basically did it to annoy museo because they were they hated each other back then oh got it yeah i tell you i, I know george everybody likes george i mean the schmiel was a tough guy i mean he he t he took no shit off anybody he yeah. certainly didn't take shit off me you guys know well shit i raised you you didn't either take shit off me you on but i came in you know just as just cop cocky prick uh and he was like he wasn't having it man he was tough on me george came in all nice and, and respectful it was nice to you so look this is for example this is sean yates look at uh, that gear Oh, far oh. Look, he's gonna, uh, the, he's got, here comes Sean, you know, far behind. And, you know, this is the proof that you can never give up. Olaf Ludwig's there. You can never give up in Paris Roubaix because at the end, they're going to make it uh, most likely to the, to the front group. Adri van der Poel, Johan Kapiot. So the other interesting thing is if you watch close enough and you, and you know enough about motorcycles, so the guys in France who protect the bike races, whether it's the Tour or the Dauphiné, any other big race, it's the gendarmes. And so they always ride, you know, typically BMWs, big street motos. For this race, they have the enduro version, as does, you saw there, the Mavic wheel support, also an enduro version. So basically a, a hybrid, like a, potentially a cross. So and, here, uh, we have, here we have the, the winners from the year before. Duclos Lazal and Ballerini, first and second, and Museo. Basically, you know, everybody for himself. You know, it's it's just fight for survival and to stay upright on those on those slippery cobbles. And uh, here comes Museo with his special bike. And so I guess now we're going to see something really interesting, which is uh, you know Duclos is there and and Ballerini taking oh, the corner. There. Look at this. Look at the conditions. That was a foot of water. Yeah. Mud. Wow. And this is, this, this, yeah, this is a lot, a lot of the same guys. I mean, you guys, you guys and gals recognize this from last week. I mean, this was a one year off well, look, from that 1990. Well, Rini has a flat. And look at the time. Look at the time he's going to have to wait for a uh, uh, mechanical assistant. This is, this is unbelievable. I mean, he's going to have to wait forever. And you know, that's a big difference between then and now. It's like now all the big teams have at least two swan yours on every section with wheels. Yes. And the riders know exactly where they are. So right now, if this was in today's time, he would have to go another maximum kilometer to get a wheel. Where now yeah, he's, look, he's, he's quite fighting to stay upright with a flat with a flat rear wheel. And there's just nobody coming. Not not even not, not, no team car, of course, because they're far behind with uh, with those circumstances. And even the, the neutral support. Um, you know, the motorbike uh, is going to come ultimately. 
Uh, but look, Duke de Lazal, at the same time, puncture. Number one and two from the year before. And no help from uh, any team car or any swan. You're, nobody, nobody, you're a lot nobody. different now. And yeah, so the image there says crevaison, which means flat tire. I mean, there's just nothing. Uh, again, if you had just clicked this on right now while ESPN going you the 2001 World Series, you'd watch this and go, what are we, this doesn't look like a competitive event. This is, but this is what it's like. And this is, to, to, to George's point and to Johan's point, you just can't give up. Like, these guys are not out of the bike race. No, far from. And, and, and by the way, they know it. So they just, it's, they, flying they're, 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 it's, it's flying by. They're not standing on the side of the road waiting for a, 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 a new wheel. They, they just keep pedaling with, with the flat tire on the rim, which you can only imagine what that's doing to the rim. And uh, I, can, I can attest to how slippery that is when you have a flat tire and riding on wet cobblestones. It's near impossible keeping your bike straight and staying upright. Hmm. <laughs> So these guys are oh, thinking right now that they got to go as long as they can, try to stay upright until until they get help from a neutral support or one of their team cars. But right now they're in a bit of a tough spot. Yeah. So here comes here comes the support. Here comes the Mavic. So basically, they have to fight now for who who gets the wheel the first. So here's a question for for both of y'all, but maybe more for you, Johan. Was this because nowadays you have, as you have, uh, even just fans? I mean, the 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 teams will have either fans, soigneurs, uh, uh, spare mechanics, just out on the course with wheels, basically staged and stationed all over the course. Whereas this just doesn't. I mean, he had to wait for neutral support. He had no choice. Look, look at Ballerini has to run back. Look! 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 <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, to answer your question, Lance, I mean, I guess back then, you know, teams were very reduced also in terms of staff. And they just didn't have the resources. You know, they, they, were, they made sure that they had people on the very important sections, but you couldn't be at all of them. I mean, nowadays, Paris Roubaix and George, George will be able to, to confirm that better. It's, it's crazy. I mean, you have basically have 40, 50 people working for the team on that particular race. Yeah, the planning that goes on with the Swaneurs now – as to what section they're going to, what, what section they're going to be at, what time they're going to be there. The riders know where they are. The directors know where they are. So if you get a flat tire, you know you're going to have help fairly quickly. Boy, this is just, and in, in you go back, these, these, these years in the mid-90s, the, if you wonder what year you're in, just look at the cars. <laughs> that just tells you. So here, this is, this is now Museo chasing, uh, chasing Chmil. This is going to go on. I remember what I remember was that this is going to go on for kilometers and kilometers. And everybody was thinking, okay, Museo is going to come back to Chmil, uh, which ultimately he almost does. But this is, I mean, this was an amazing performance of Andre Chmil. I mean, this, he went, he, he went by himself. Uh, he said in the interview at kilometer with 63 kilometers to go. Wow. And just effectively becomes a drag race, just every, yeah. just a, a drag race or a time trial. And of course, as we touched on last week, in these any chance they can, a, a, a photo bike comes by, camera bike, anything, just any little advantage they could uh, try to get, just even for a second or two. Look at eight seconds. I mean, eight seconds. By the way, even at the speed, he is right there. I mean, Johan Museo is looking up. It looks like he could reach out and grab him, um, but they're effectively, obviously, both going the same speed. Uh, so close, yet so far. When you think right. about a lot of these sections, I mean, they're, when it's wet in particular, sometimes it's, it's almost as good to be alone than it is to be with a group because you're able to choose your lines. You're not around with guys sliding out in front of you. And um, perhaps at, at moments in, the, uh, uh, in conditions like this, it's a bit of an advantage to be by yourself. He, he accelerated again and, uh, and just basically, you know, came to the finish with almost two minutes, I think. I tell you what, I love, I love when people think that way. I, I could say that about some people. <laughs> were they using radios at this time? No, were, no, no, no. They were just getting splits from the moto? Yes. No, here, the, the, the team car. The team car is you know, constantly encouraging mm -hmm. him. And basically, when and all, I, can, I, I can imagine he's going to say now, okay, in the back, Musee is going to be joined by two, of his team, by, by, by two riders, one of his teammates. But Schmil just kept going, you know? And, and that who just pulled up in that car we spoke about him last week was Mark Sargent. No, it was Jean-Luc Vandenbroek. 
Like I said, you know, it looked exactly like Jean-Luc Van der Brink. <laughs> it, looked, it looked exactly, it, you know, I just trained for it. I knew what I was talking about. I know y'all know I know all this stuff, but uh, and for the for those who do know cycling, and, and that name sounds familiar, that is the uncle of the late great Frank Van der Broek. But also look look at the position. I mean, you, you know, it's it, it's it's basically completely different than what you see now. It's super short, super low. Yeah, you know, like this well, this is just a, a, you know well, whatever. He he's going thirty he's going thirty miles an hour. I mean, I yeah. there, I don't know that, but he you can see how fast he's going, even even with those conditions, old gear, he's, he's, this dude is hauling ass right here. By the way, can I just say to, you know, cause Lotto over the years has had some of the ugliest jerseys of all time. This was the best they've ever looked. I loved this. I did. I lo- I loved this Jersey. Even, even racing against, I was like, all right, that's solid. That's solid. It's, it's actually incredible. I mean, we talked about it last week that this team is still, around and one of the top teams it was a top team then it's still a top team now you know we're 26 years later yeah shout out to that uh, that company for sticking around and that team that management team to sticking around for so many years they're, they're a iconic team in the sport of cycling yeah so here so here you know the the difference is already 40 seconds and here we have Johan Museo who has a problem with his you know prototype bike and I was, I, was, I was checking, first of all, you know, hats off because, I mean, he managed to, he's, he's panicking. He doesn't get out of the pedals, but stays on the bike. <laughs> and here we'll see the mechanic. He almost breaks his ankle. Look at this. Look at this. Yo, and they were riding Bianchi's that year? Yes. Look at this. Look. I mean, that's unbelievable. Look at that. I'll, I'll just do a track stand for you while you fix my bike. <laughs> <laughs> So that's Patrick Lefebvre giving him the bike, still around today. And here he goes again. But I think that's, that's you know, that's the beginning of the end. You know, he was, uh, he was already losing terrain and now he's on a, on a normal, normal uh, bike, not the, not the suspension bike. But, you know, even if he was still strong, I think mentally, this must be incredible to overcome at that stage of the race. So, George Carrefour de Larbra, you, you know very much how, how hard this is. Yeah, one of, one of the last sections of the race. By the time you get there, you're just, everything in your body is hurting, and uh, you're just thinking about getting to the, last, to the finish line. You're about 15 kilometers from the finish line here. You know, I mean, it's Schmil. I mean, being being out there for sixty plus kilometers and still going this speed, look, two minutes, two minutes on the first uh, on the first chasers. That's just that's just enormous, incredible. So, and um, there's uh, there's actually two teammates. There is Museo and Ludwig Willems, both from the same team, chasing him, and he just keeps gaining terrain. I mean, I think, you know, it seems to me there, there has to be, uh, even with the mechanical and you're sitting there for, I mean, you I mean, say you sat there for probably a minute, you have to be thinking, well, there is a chance. I mean, look at the conditions. There is a chance he has a mechanical or he has a flat or a crash or something. That's the only thing that keeps you going. Otherwise, if you see two minutes, you're like, this is over. But you just got to keep in mind that anything can happen really at any time. Yeah, I mean, look, look, look what just happened. You have Baldato and Sean Yates joining. I mean, now there's three guys of the same team of Museo, plus Sean Yates, who was already very far behind in Arenberg and then was held up by the crash of the motorbikes, and he came back. So, you know, you, you have to think, yes, he can crash. You know, he can have a puncture. Anything can happen. Yeah, there's no way. You cannot lose your focus here. With, all, with how wet and slick these cobbles are, um, just any little mistake you can slide out and end up like in, in the ditch, which I've happened to end up in that ditch right about there uh, one year myself. <laughs> but also, George, I mean, and you can, you can testify to this, I guess. You know, if you're on a day like Schmil, he was, you know, it was, this was a special day for him. He was, once you're there and you're in that zone, you don't make the mistakes that you could normally make. You know, it's no. pure down to bad luck. It's not that. No. He's definitely on an incredible day, and 
You're right. You don't make those mistakes. It's, it's when you're completely out of energy, you start bonking, that's when you make those mistakes. Well, he wasn't going to make any mistakes this day. I mean, this is, he, he, he was, uh, he was, uh, in, in a special place there and, 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 uh, yeah, it's all, yeah. Again, and the other thing that we, we touched on earlier too, about the velodrome, you know, it's not when we think of, or if you, for example, if you watch the Olympic games, that those are very steep velodromes and, you know, 30 plus degrees, potentially even more. Um, this is a, what you, what they would call a shallow or, or not so steep velodrome. What, is, what is the banking here? It's, it's not, it's not very much, right? No, it's not steep at all. It, and, and it's, and it's concrete. So, you know, basically it's, uh, well, anyway, here, here we have Chmiel entering the velodrome, the, the mythical velodrome of, uh, of Roubaix. And this must be an amazing feeling, you know, know, knowing that you have such an incredible advantage that not, nothing can happen to you anymore. You know what I think is also great? They put up the barriers here when there's no people there. <laughs> and this, is, this, is so, this is how backward cycling can be sometimes. They're all, by, hey, psst, hello, they're all back there in the forest. <laughs> you take that you take that right turn onto the velodrome there's no there's really like you said the feeling the the noise that you hear even though you've seen millions of people throughout the day this the feeling and the the sound and the the vibe you get when you enter that velodrome is like no other in in, in any race in the peloton in the in the of the season yep and it's not one that uh myself or or johan never experienced so he's what now has another full lap to go so that, or is he done no, 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 but he has to go down because it's wet and slippery. Oh so my he, God. And even, even if it's not, if it's, even if it's not very steep, he, he needs to stay down. Well, I mean, imagine coming in here with 10 guys. Mm-hmm. I mean, cause it would, with, with these guys have worked their whole life. They've dreamed about this their whole life. They don't care if it's slippery. This, that would be, I mean, 10 dudes, they're not waving, you know, then they're not worrying about staying down low. They're, they, they just take the risk. As we do. If, you, if, you, if you've made it through all the danger of all those cobblestone sections, the last thing in your mind is crashing on the velodrome. You're not even thinking about that. <laughs> Look, so Chuy well, basically did, did the, an hour, uh, one lap and a half, and the, the next ones are not, uh, not even on the velodrome yet. Uh, just, it's a shame that, that uh, in light of all the coronavirus uh, all over the world, that we're not, uh, you know, that this, is, this race is you know, potentially not going to happen this year. And, and, you know, hopefully, I think there's some talk about actually having these classics as a, as fall classics, which would be uh, mm. a, a real treat for, for all of us fans. Yeah, this is Ballerini, Ballerini and Baldato, the, 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 you know, the best of the rest, we would say, right? Because Schmiel was in another league. And I guess we're going to see a little sprint now for uh, who takes second and third. And Baldato's the fastest right. for sure. Yeah, no. This is this is uh, the, the, this should be a fairly easy sprint for Balta. Look how fast they're going. <laughs> I mean, after this is 160 plus miles on cobbles, but Baldato has to go over the top, which he just made look really easy. Um, great couple of years for him in the spring classics. Wow. How about that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the guy who won that bike race, who we talked about as well, who, who featured prominently in in, uh, in some of the Flanders coverage, was Andre Schmiel. And we have uh, the good fortune uh, of having him as a special guest. Thank you to Johan for setting that up. Uh, you guys are going to – Johan, I'm going to turn it over to you. Andre's a little more comfortable in French, so uh, fire away. Wait, okay, okay. Uh, so I'll, I'll ask André a few questions uh, in French. And uh, André, uh, tout d'abord, bienvenue et, et merci, merci beaucoup pour, uh, pour nous joindre. Uh, on parle ah de ta, ta fameuse victoire uh, en 1994 à Paris-Roubaix. Et tout d'abord, uh, bon, tous, les, tous les amateurs du cyclisme, uh, on a lu uh, dernièrement que tu avais quelque, une situation de santé. Donc, euh, tout d'abord, euh, si ça ne t'importe pas, euh, on voudrait bien prendre, prendre de tes nouvelles. Et comment ça va euh, au niveau de la santé? Bon, euh, merci, merci pour la, l'intéressement. Bon, ça va, ça va, tout va bien. Je suis à nouveau, je peux à nouveau avoir la, les joies de vivre. J'ai, j'étais presque prêt de reprendre, de reprendre, de rouler en vélo et courir, 
comme j'étais habitué, mais avec la situation du coronavirus, on ne peut pas, parce que nous sommes tous bloqués à la maison. Mais au, au, général, au général, tout va bien. Je me récupère euh, assez vite et j'espère euh, que ça, très bientôt, ça va être encore mieux. Okay, je ne peux bah, pas gagner. Je ne peux, peux plus gagner euh, au Paris-Roubaix, mais ça va, je suis bien. Oui, mais c'est une course plus importante à gagner maintenant et je, on, on, est sûr, on est sûr que tu vas réussir. On est tous avec toi et, euh, et on est très content de, de t'accueillir aujourd'hui. Euh, bon, comme tu sais, on va parler de ta, de ta victoire de, dans paris groupé et j'avais deux questions euh, pour expliquer un petit peu euh, comment on va voir euh, après dans l'émission. Dans euh, donc, tu es parti... Euh, tout seul, euh, très loin de l'arrivée, euh, dans cette édition de 1994, euh, dans, des, dans des circonstances euh, climatologiques très, euh, très dures. La question est, est-ce que tu avais planifié à l'avant cette attaque si loin de, de, de l'arrivée ou est-ce que c'est quelque chose qui est arrivé selon les circonstances euh, des courses mais bon, c'est pas bon. À, à la fin, à la fin, mon, mon attaque, c'était relever l'échappée les plus l'échappée victorieuse plus longue. C'était 63 km. Mais je voulais pas partir. Absolument. Pour moi, c'était assez assez longue et assez loin de l'arrivée. Mais on était là, tous les grands favoris, et c'était les attaques une après l'autre. Et quand euh, énième fois il est mon ami et actuellement, et les grands concurrents dans l'époque, Johan Musev, il allait chercher une autre concurrent qui c'était Franco Ballerini. Bon, je lui ai dit, OK, je veux inviter Musev. C'était uniquement pour inviter. Je voulais, je voulais le faire souffrir un petit peu plus et j'attaquais. Et je visais un petit, un petit quelque chose, un petit arbre à 200 mètres. Et je dis, bon, je veux rouler jusqu'à 200 mètres et après je veux regarder qu ce qui se passe derrière. Et quand j'ai arrivé à 200 mètres, je l'ai vu qu'il n'y a plus personne derrière. Et moi, je lui ai dit, bon, je ne peux, peux pas retourner. Je ne suis, suis pas en faisant. Alors, j'ai continué. J'ai continué. Et après, bon, c'était la succession des kilomètres. Un kilomètre, trois kilomètres, cinq kilomètres. Arrivé, arrivé à l'Ardoisier, il, il m'a donné un minute. Et moi, je lui ai dit, bah, quand tu as une minute d'avance, à Paris-Roubaix, personne qui, qui retourne à l'arrière. Alors, voilà, c'est comme ça que je suis parti. En tout cas, c'était impressionnant. Je pense que, comme tu dis, l'échappée victorieuse la plus longue, euh, tout seul. Donc, euh, vraiment, on est, on est vraiment impressionné en, en revoyant les, les images. Euh, et deuxi deuxième question. J'ai battu, battu Fausto Coppi. Lui, il a fait 59. Et moi, j'ai ah, fait oui. 61. Mais qui est Fausto Coppi et qui, et qui je suis André Schmil par rapport à Fausto Coppi ça, c'était une bonne chose. Pour, pour gagner cette course-là, pour gagner cette course -là, c est, c est, c est, c est quand même, il faut, il faut être un grand champion. Deuxième question euh, qu'on qu avait après la révision des images. Euh, à un certain moment, tu es parti. Il y a un, une grande bataille entre toi et Johan Musseu, euh, deux grands rivaux. Euh, à l'époque, pas contre lui, lui contre toi. Vous étiez à l'époque certainement pas des amis, je pense. Maintenant, oui, mais à l'époque, pas. Euh, il y a un certain moment que Musset revient à 7 secondes. Et donc, ma, ma, ma question est, qu'est-ce que tu as pensé à ce moment-là quand tu as vu que Musset, il était venu si près Est-ce que tu as pensé, OK, je continue, j'ai la force jusqu'à l'arrivée Ou est-ce que tu as douté un petit peu et peut-être dire, euh, j'essaie d'attaquer après dans la dernière euh, tu peux nous, bon. nous expliquer un peu qu'est-ce qui t'est passé par la tête à ce moment-là bon, euh, J'étais bien informé que quand je suis parti, que c'est l'équipe du monsieur qui doit organiser, qu'ils ont fait une longue chasse et qu'ils sont revenus assez proches dans, chez moi. Mais on était à Paris-Roubaix avec les, avec les pluies, la neige parfois, la pluie était assez glissante. Et je rentre dans un secteur et voilà qu ce qui joue devant moi, les motos du photographe qui est tombé. Je ne sais pas si tu te souviens, c'était le fameux italien Peruzzo avec les motos, beaucoup, beaucoup de photos ensemble. Et les motos, il est tombé devant moi. Alors, j'ai dû arrêter 
j'ai mis les pieds euh, sur terre, je suis reparti, du mal à arriver à, 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 à ses proches, à ses proches. Bien, Van den Broek, qui était mon directeur sportif, elle a dit, ah, il est derrière monsieur, attends, vous, vous allez rouler en deux. Moi, je dis, bon, ça pouvait être n'importe qui. Ça pouvait être n'importe quelle personne qui, qui vient derrière. Et moi, je l'attends, mais pas lui. Alors, si tu veux venir, si tu veux qu'on roule deux en deux, tu dois venir me prendre. Et j'étais là, regardais mon compteur, et je dis, allez, allez, allez. Allez, le, le, le 44 km h 44 km h pas 45, pas 43, 44 km Il était là comme ça, le kilomètre par kilomètre, le secteur par secteur. Et après, la deuxième vie, ils disent 11 secondes, 12 secondes. Je dis, allez, continue, continue, 44, 44, 44, 44, 44, et voilà, pff, Johan est explosé. Je me rappelle très bien, je me rappelle très bien. Écoute, euh, André, on ne va pas prendre beaucoup plus de ton temps. Euh... Uh, Hans, I don't know if you want to say something to to Andre and George. Yeah, no, I just, I just, <clears throat> excuse me, I just, I, I, and I've said it uh, before we got before Andre joined us. I mean, this was a a, a special version to watch and an epic victory. And Andre, I know that uh, we now have another common besides uh, being former professional cyclist, but the fight against cancer. So we're all pulling for you and uh, wishing, our, uh, wishing our best for you. Bon chance avec, uh, avec la santé. I likewise, with Lance said, we're thinking about him right now. We know he's going through a tough time with his health, but also I wanted to thank him because that year that he won Roubaix was my first year as a professional cyclist. And, you know, being a young sort of American He kind of got pushed around a lot in the peloton in those years, and Andre was always super nice. Yep. Very, like he was always very friendly, and I, even though he was known as a killer in the bunch, for some reason he was nice to me. So I want to thank him for uh, being very a cool guy to me when I was back in the day when he was uh, obviously one of the best in the peloton. Uh, uh, that's because everybody's nice to you. He was not nice to me at all. <laughs> he was not nice to me at all. Andre, tu comprends? T'as compris un peu? Oui, en, en général, mais pas ouais. les, les particularités. Non, non, mais OK. OK, donc tous les deux, euh, ils te souhaitent euh, beaucoup de succès dans, dans cette course, cette nouvelle course que tu es en train de, de faire. Euh, yeah. Mais bon, on, euh, George aussi, il dit qu'il qu veut te remercier pour, euh, pour l'avoir inspiré parce que ta victoire en 94, c'était sa première participation à Paris-Roubaix. Et qu'après, tu as toujours été, euh, as toujours été euh, très gentil avec lui. Lance, au contraire, il dit que c'est normal parce que tout le monde est toujours très gentil avec, avec George. Mais, euh, mais avec lui, tu n'étais pas très gentil, très, si gentil qu'avec George parce que c était, c était, vous étiez deux, deux, euh, deux assassins, des killers dans, dans le, dans bah, le euh, cyclisme. Bah, je, je, moi, je, moi, je rentre pas dans, le, dans la polémique. On a vécu des, les, les moments très, très bons. Oui. Chacun, à mon avis, chacun, il a eu tout ce qu'il a mérité. Peut-être quelqu'un de moins, quelqu'un de plus. Et, et j'ai une très, très bonne histoire dans ma tête avec, avec George, avec Mr. George, Mr. George, qui était là, je l'ai rappelé comme ça, toujours, avec Lance. Alors, la, la vie, ça continue. On a, on a quelque chose, on a quelque chose euh, dans notre tête, on a quelque chose dans notre histoire. Et moi, je pense que c'est quelque chose de Voilà. C'est pas, parfait. OK. On te remercie beaucoup, beaucoup. Thanks, André. André. Beaucoup de succès et tout le meilleur. Hans, George, Johan. Merci. Thank you very much. Merci. Thank you. Grazie. Ciao. 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 Okay, so now we're going to jump ahead to the 2005 Pierre Roubaix. This is one that, uh, as actually right as we cut in, well, we know this team, Team Discovery at the front. Our man, George Hincapi. Uh, George, this was your best ride here, uh, uh, result-wise. I'm assuming it was also probably your, the day you felt the best. You can, you can chime in there. But uh, what, what are it looking like? Obviously, different conditions, dry roads, fast. Looks like it's windy. Look at the, just the, the, the frenzy. Uh, is that Michael Berry? Yeah, yeah. Michael, Michael Berry, just you just look at that, George. You're looking good. So, George, take and, us and to how are you feeling here at this at this point? 
I'm feeling really good. Like I mentioned uh, last week, we had uh, I had gotten sick before b- b- before San Remo. Thought I was out for the classics. Bounced back. The Tour of Flanders felt pretty good there. But by the time we got to Roubaix, I felt 100. percent um, And I had really had a, a good bunch of guys around me: Roger Hammond, Michael Berry. These guys were really there to put it all on the line for me. And uh, you know, we took we took control of the race pretty early on. Kept me kept me safe. Kept me up at the front. And even though it's a it's a mildly dry day. There was a lot of wet patches that day, which makes it super dangerous if you're in the middle of the bunch. So you, as you can see here, these guys are keeping me right up there. Yeah, and I guess I guess you know one of the one of the tactics is also you know even if it's not super super difficult, but being in the front and stretching out the peloton, as we will see here, this is one of the next sections. So the team is still leading, and uh, you're there in second position. Whenever there's something happening, which, you know, it's going to happen now, probably there's going to be a big crash in the peloton. And you see here we, in this corner, I guess. Yeah, here we go. So look, look at this. And you guys, you know, you and Hammond and Michael Barry, and probably one other of the, of the teammates just, you know, made it. Um, and you're all safe. So it's a safety issue also. Absolutely. And then, you know, you can see it's a drier edition of Roubaix, but that means there's a lot more people there later on into the race, which makes it just as dangerous because there's nowhere to go. One guy crashes and uh, you're pretty much stuck on the side of the on the road there and really hard yeah, to get through. I mean, and this here you see, I mean, people everywhere. And, and look, this is Tom Steels, the Belgian champion. Um, Mm. So lot, one of Lotto, one of the Lotto guys, so uh, Peter van Peterjam is in that crash, which one of the big favorites. And 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 you know, funnily enough, this is still early in the race, but he's going to he's going to make it back to the peloton, which is which is you know crazy. Yeah. yeah when we were watching this earlier, I had no idea. I didn't realize how long he was actually sitting there, um, sort of assessing his injuries, and he made it back later on into the race and got amongst it again with the leaders. Look, here's here's a repeat of the of the crash. So that's basically, you know, thirty percent of the peloton has gone through, and the rest is the rest is stuck. So what are we talking about? I mean, you're, here you have clearly a day where it is not raining, right? But the, these sections are just wet and muddy because maybe it rained the day before or three days before, and it just didn't dry out. So despite the fact that pavement's dry, it's not raining, and this stuff just stays wet, and so you got to deal with it as if it's a a muddy, rainy and muddy day. Yeah, that and that was, um, you know, a lot of this stuff was dependent on the knowledge of the directors, the knowledge of what's coming up ahead. Uh, even though the race generally heads north, it's going twisting and turning the whole way up. So the good directors and the, and the, the local riders kind of know which way the wind is going to be blowing on, each, blowing on each particular section. So you saw us on the front there. My guess is that we kind of had some, you know, knowledge that that section was going to be either crosswind tailwind and a bit you know wet at times which made us want to be up front more than than the other sections with, so with, george I, I, you know uh, this is this is the edition where we have this a new client there's is, there's a section with was a climb yeah so here you see you see uh lotos on the front so it may, means that van peterham has made it back already yeah he had made it back and this section was, you know, it was a bit anticlimactic. The, the, the dangerous part of it was it was a downhill coming into it on cobblestones, mm-hmm. which made it very dangerous, and it made it more stressful for the riders. And I think the battle to get there in the front was a bit more um, enhanced because of the potential danger. Yeah, and, and also have a look. I mean, you see all the favorites of the big teams in the front. Uh, you know, we have a few Discovery, Discovery guys here up front. You are there, and, and Hammond is there, and, and Leif Hosta is there. And now you'll see in the in the back of the peloton, you know, the usual suspects, you know, the Spanish teams, the the guys who are there because they have to be there, but they don't want to be there. This is quite uh, an, an interesting an interesting image here in the last part of the peloton. It's Uskaltel and Kelmi and uh, you know Sonia Duval. Here, here they are, the Spanish. And by the way, those are teams. You know, I'm sorry, I'm just going to say they shouldn't be in this bike race. They shouldn't. <laughs> they they shouldn't they. What you guys back? Don't go! Don't go quiet on me right now. You leave it. Don't, <laughs> they, they they should not be. Well, well that, that I don't. I'm not sure at that point. But now you have to be. The World Tour teams have to attend all the World Cup races, uh, which I, I think. Mean, here, yeah. here, we see, here we see. You know the the numbers again. You know numbers uh, important on the team. Posato, Bornen, same team. 
Mickelson, George, and Buxted. So those basically are the five guys who, who are making the selection. Afterwards, I guess there's a few other guys, but this is a decisive moment in the race. Even if there's a breakaway still up front, which we haven't seen, but there's a breakaway far in, the, uh, in front, which, which went from the beginning of the season. Here, another couple. Fasa Bortolo is Fletcher and Cancelara. Cancelara. You are not making the split. You, don't, you didn't see that very, very often later on in his career. <laughs> Yeah, actually, later on, Fletcher is going to drive it and Cancellara is going to get dropped. Yeah, correct. But this is obviously a crucial, a crucial section. You know, you're, this is the strong man who separate from the rest. Pozzato looks like he's, you know, like, Pozzato looks like he's riding on, on normal pavement. He doesn't. He, he looks completely effortless. Look at this. Completely uh-huh. effortless. Well, George, George looks very comfortable, too. Look at this. Yeah, I was feeling quite good there. I was very confident um, with how I was feeling, happy with the way I was feeling. And um, the fact that I was making these selections without going into the red zone was a good sign of uh, where I was going to end up that day. Yeah. Was that so Backstead? Is, is that Magnus Backstead again? That's yes. Back. Yeah. yeah, so he was in the, he was in the, front, at the front of both races. So he had, one, he had one the year before, right, George? Backstead won the year before, correct? Yes, and so and so we looked at Flanders last week. So that was basically his training for Paris Roubaix because he was the whole day in the breakaway. Yeah. So here we have now nine guys together with you know uh, Fletcher and Bambon who have joined and Cancellara. Mm-hmm. And who's this Gerald Steiner here? Sebastian Lang. He was in the oh, breakaway, Sebastian I believe. Lang. Okay. Wow. He was, oh, so he was last man standing right. from the breakaway. Yeah. Okay. That's like winning the lottery. <laughs> so this is now basically a race down to eight people. There's nobody from the back who's going to come back. This, these are the eight strongest riders of the race. Now it's starting to spring. Looks, and we are starting to get some weather. Starting to sprinkle a little bit as we. Even if there. there's still a bunch of like, there's, I think there's still five or six riders in the front at the breakaway, but that's not uh, really a worry. For the, for the final of the race because the, the strong guys are here and they will ultimately catch them. Mikkelsen is going quite strong. He was also strong already in Flanders, by the way, the weekend before. Yeah, he was always one of those guys that came, came, came alive for the classics. But in, in a position like this, when you're with six, seven guys, the favorites of the race, that's kind of where you want to show that you're maybe not one of the best guys. So yeah. every time I would pull through, I'd try to pull through at like 60, 70% as opposed to 80, 90% to try to make it look like I was suffering more than it actually was. Mm-hmm. And I guess everybody's playing the same game, right? So it's, yeah. it's basically a poker game. Absolutely. Well, a poker game all the while balancing, knowing that you have to stay away. You don't want you know, another group or two to come back to you and all of a sudden your, your eight-man uh, comfortable situation goes to 15 or 20. I mean, you, you, so you got to still stay. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a delicate balance, right? So here we're catching a breakaway, uh, yeah. which always adds to the, the complications on who's in the group and who's going to do more of the, more of the work. Um, so right now you're kind of assessing who's up there, what teams are up there, and if in fact yeah, you get a hand you, would think, you would think probably, George, that you know, it could happen that, okay, now Bonin is by himself because, because Pozzato uh, is, is gone, I guess. Uh, but you know, there could be another teammate that ha- they had sent up the road. Yeah. In this case, it's not, the, it's not the case, but it can always happen. So this is now one of the, also one of the, the strong set, four, four stars, four star section. So, so quite hard and it's, you know, survival of the, of the, fr- of the freshest, I guess, right? Yeah. Now it's a race of attrition. It's, there's not much, you know, messing around there. It's who's got any little bit of energy left now. We're all, you can see we're all working together fairly well. Um, it's not like one guy is sitting on. It's, we're all just trying to get to the finish line there. and um, You don't have really the, the option to just sit on there. you got to work. George, any flats this year? What, what, uh... I got a flat early on, which um, I, I believe Michael Berry gave me his wheel or helped me back. But, yeah, it was, it, fortunately, it wasn't at a crucial part of the race. Mm-hmm. Also, I mean, you know, when it's dry and co- compared to the other, the other edition, you obviously see where you're riding. 
you know, there's no, there's no puddles, there's no mud. Um, and this is obviously the best, the best place to be on the top of the cobbles compared to riding on the sides. Well, you take more on the sides, you definitely take more risk of puncturing yeah. just because you have those, you know, the gravel and the rocks that really can uh, elevate your risk of flatting. And then, then you're out of, at this point, if you flat here, you're out of the race. So you get, a, you get perhaps a bit of a break on the sides because it's not as bumpy, but you're taking more risk. So mm-hmm. you've got to figure out what's, uh, if it's worth it or not. And, you, and George, what are you doing? Like, I see, I see, you know, you're sitting there fourth, fifth wheel, or, and obviously you want to stay close enough to get full draft. Are you just trusting? Obviously, you, you don't want to open a gap so you can get a better line of sight. But, I mean, are you just trusting the guys in front of you and just saying we're all going to ride the same? At that point, like Johan said, it's relatively dry. Um, you trust the guys that you're with. And I'm, I'm guessing right there that I'm feeling pretty good that even though there was a gap opening up in front of me that I'd be able to close it if I needed to. It's not like you're in a bunch of 50 guys where you get a gap of 100 meters and then you're screwed. Here are the five guys and I knew that I could react pretty quickly. Huge acceleration for Magnus Backstead. You just saw him just giving it everything full stick as they say, Here, looking back. Here you see, George, how, you know, how easy you close the gap. Yeah. You know, but also how, how fast it can change. Here we have Buckstead, who's obviously feeling good as the, you know, defending, defending his title, trying to drop everybody. And on the next section, he'll just get, you know, get out the back door. So now Fletcher's going to give it a go, I guess. Yeah, Fletcher was riding really good that day. And uh, he was definitely putting the hurt on us here. But we were, like I said, I was still feeling really good there and knew that I was able to close any gaps if, if they came up. Johan, has a Spaniard ever won? I don't think a Spaniard's ever won Pair Everybody. Am I right there? Absolutely. Nobody. Yeah, I mean, he, he, so he was probably their best shot ever. I mean, we're talking 100 years because uh, he was legit. He was a legit classics rider. I mean, it, yeah. Yeah. That would so that would have been the, the last uh, the last very hard part, right, George? So Cara Food de Labre is usually yeah, five I mean, stars. So. You you know in this group you know there's gonna be fireworks. It's the last yeah. chance that anybody can get away and you're going in expecting a very, very difficult hard section, hard effort. Um, so everybody is ready for something to happen here at this point. And the wind, the wind is also a factor here, right? I guess, I guess the wind yeah. was coming from the right. Yeah, you see the later on in this section, the wind is coming uh, from the right. So it's a bit of a crosswind. Uh, so you're trying to balance either riding on the correct line or getting as much of a draft as possible. And it's a very, very um, sort of weird dynamic to where you, you want to get the draft, but you also don't want to get stuck in the, the uh, more bumpy sections of the cobblestones. So here everything looks still okay for everybody. And all of a sudden. If you're not feeling it here, your legs are just like rubber. You got nothing left. And you can see Baxter here starts really getting into the herd zone there and just starts losing the wheel. Yeah, Fletcher's definitely trying, giving it, you know, he knows that he's probably the slowest sprinter of all. So he... He's just trying to eliminate two guys to make sure that he's on the podium, which, you know, is probably a good tactic. Okay, look at, you see the crosswind here with the, with the Belgian, Belgian flag. flag. Basically. Yeah, and for, for those who haven't looked on the map, I mean, this is right on the French and Belgian border. So that's, I think it's safe to say, and of course the Belgians having dominated this event for, you know, for many, many years, this, this is, for a lot of those guys, it's almost like they're racing in their backyard. Like, Look, that was Michelson. Michelson just exploded. Look at that. That's in a, it. Looks like he has a flat, but I think yeah, he has a flat in the legs. Seeing the deuces move right there. It's got that, flat. Oh, I think it's, it's a double flat. With the banches, as they say in Flemish. Yeah. But you know, it's, it's, it's seeing. It's seeing um, when I watch these races, having never done them, I would, it's cool to see. You, know, you see a team like CSC, and then you see our team. So George represented us here. Michelson represented CSC there. But we knew that we would see them. We'd see Michelson and George, obviously, in July. But 
and we would then it was our turn to represent the team. I just love seeing these teams that fucking raced, you know, twelve months a year. You know, I mean, they're teams that focus on tours or teams that focus on the classics. I was really proud that we, you know, we had a program that could touch them all. I know in the 2001 documentary that you guys did, that series, you, Lance, you were calling Johan in the team car while George was racing. Were you doing it this year? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Johan, it was, it was, he was in the, I didn't see what he said, but I'm sure he was in the car like, Jesus Christ, he's calling me again. He's got to stop. He's, he's got to stop calling me. Tell, tell George, tell, one year I called and I said, this is how stupid this is. This race is almost done. I said, tell George to take his knee warmers off. Like, what the fuck? I'm, I'm sitting on my couch giving wardrobe advice. So this is the only time uh, I got to lead onto the velodrome. So yeah, 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 that must be an amazing feeling, George. I mean, that's I mean, yeah. what what do you feel there when you, you know, you're coming for the first place, you know, getting to the velodrome and just you know feeling all the you know energy and the adrenaline here, taking the turn into the velodrome. Yeah, I was, uh, you know, we all knew that Tom was fast, but I came in feeling confident, thinking that I had a chance to win. It's, uh, a sprint after 260 kilometers is a lot different than any other sprint, especially after Paris Um So I was in a good position as I had ever been for that race. So here you, but you lead, and then here Fletcher comes down, and and I was going to say I would want to any any thought to to try to get on Boonen's wheel. If he'd let you, of course, he probably wouldn't have let you. No, I, I mean, I wasn't even really particularly worried about Fletcher. Of course, I was worried about Boonen. He had just won Tour of Flanders. I knew how good he was, but I came in very confident, thinking that I had a chance. And, um, well, you almost got a little help there from the Italian flag. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're ditching our dodging Italian flags there. <laughs> So everybody riding the velodrome up high, even as a shallow velodrome, you're still going to get a little benefit. But as soon as they drop in, yep, yeah, that just that you essentially start your sprint downhill. Yeah. Oh come on, George! I, I'm watching. I know the result. I'm like, come on, come on. <laughs> I know. Right. This, <laughs> yeah, I guess. I guess you know, Bonin was definitely in the form of his life. I mean, the way yeah. he had won Flanders already, huge confidence. I think, you know, it was, it was as good as it could get, George, I think. No, absolutely. I mean, look, if I had the legs, I actually was in a perfect position to win that race. Even when Bonin going with 200 meters to go, if I had the legs, that's the moment to go around right there. But you can see I'm just hanging on for dear life. Um, he just had a better sprint. I can, it's not like I can look back and say I could have done this, I could have attacked. I'm pretty sure I put everything I had into that race, and that was as good as I was going to get. So first Bonin, second George, and third Fletcher. That's the result of uh, of this. And there's okay. Well, that's <laughs> incredible, actually, at this young age, you know, to to win Flanders and Roubaix. A little it, cameo, a little cameo by James Start there, front on the kind of front and left. <laughs> the, the American photographer and journalist. Here comes Backstead. See this? He paid for that acceleration. That was. He's got to be happy. One's the year before, fourth year. That's that's a solid result. Yeah, he doesn't seem too disappointed. No, dude's like two hundred fifty pounds. We get to see George here for a sec. Look at this guy. Holy, look! How about that undershirt? That is sexy. <laughs> I am too sexy for my pants. Too sexy for all my shorts. <laughs> Oof. Oh, that's Bobke. Yeah, Bob Roll. A young Bobke. This is see. This is when he had hair and and he's so lean now. He rides all the time. Look look at the difference. There's my dad too. My dad's right there. That's kind of cool. yeah. George, you look exactly the same. That's that's <laughs> that's that's really. Oh, look at Mel. How beautiful. Wow. Wow, Julia. You got. Do you have to show Julia this? Look at this. I did. Both I, I, you both look the same. This is completely demoralizing. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I mean, it is. It is. It is. I mean. It's unbelievable. Yeah, that's a great race. Yours, congratulations with your podium on Paris Roubaix. <laughs> Thank you. I got a bit more white in my beard now, that's for sure. But we uh, can't talk Paris Roubaix and do one of the most Google George Hincapi moments ever searched on YouTube. So we have a little treat for the for the the, the viewer at home. This is uh, this is a short wow. I cannot even get through it. 
this is a this is this was some of the hardest footage to watch and really just inexplainable i mean it was it, nobody knew what happened george george what the hell were you thinking when all of a sudden that bike just went away that's a, clearly a broken collarbone well it's a bit of a state of panic where i'm riding I'm in a great position we got two other teammates with me which i, I feel is really funny if we replay it or do the slow-mo like everybody turned around and my two teammates are like oh that sucks fuck him let's go <laughs> <laughs> they didn't really care but uh, it was definitely kind of a there one you go. watch this watch this all of a sudden, just uh, the bars are gone. Yeah. The handlebars, ah, wow, are gone. Uh, it, was that the fork, the stem, the bar? What gave? Here, that's on. Oh, buddy! And by the way, you hit dirt. Oh yeah, no. Imagine that's, if you had hit the stones. Look at they see here. There's Juan, our mechanic. He's the, like, the, oh, the, no, no, the fork. So did the fork at at the, where where the headset? attaches to the to the to the um what do you call it the fork crown there or whatever did it just separate correct the lesson is uh use a use a torque wrench when you're with when you're tightening your your stem to your steer tube there on the on the fork because i think that uh slowly chipped away at the steer tube and it ended up cracking on me but the reason why i put my hands up was i was trying to lean over and crash in the grass as opposed to crashing in the cobblestone and it backfired on me because the panda bars went into my front wheel and made me catapult forward into the embankment of the grass. You got 50% credit because you, you didn't get the handlebar thing right, but you landed off of the cobbles. So Correct. we'll give you, we'll give you five, out, five out of 10 stars there. <laughs> that just, you know, ladies and gents, that just shows you the brutality and the unpredictable nature of this event. And one that, you know, frankly, watching these things, you, you sort of scratch yourself and like, couldn't you have done one? Like, just go to one. Just to say you did it, um, but what you know, one of the most beautiful monuments in cycling, and 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 as I alluded to earlier, hopefully we have a chance at some point this season to see the actual race. Um, but uh, you know, for now, this will this will have to do. This is the Move Podcast, brought to you by Patron uh, Team. Thanks for joining in, everybody listening and watching. Thanks for joining in, and uh, we'll see you all what next week in Amstel Gold Race. Next weekend, and yeah, and just to tease that a little, I I think if I had to pick, if I had to pick one, I, I mean, you know, I I have a special place for Flanders, but I knew it could never win the the Amstel Gold Race. Is a, I loved, loved, loved that race. So hopefully, you guys pick some versions that I was in, or at least at the front of the race. And so, and send uh, questions. Be- if you have questions specifically about Amstel Gold, that'd be great. The move at we do dot team. Thank y'all. Thank you. Thanks everybody. <laughs>